First of all, let me thank IIT Roorkee for inviting me to be here and uh, Krishna Mohan for the generous introduction. I am very happy to see young students, the faculties of various departments and this is certainly a great honor to give a public lecture to the institute members whom I am told those who are here will consist of people from chemistry, biotechnology, physics, engineering and computer science and what not. So therefore, I have tried to give a, a very general talk. So it has to be sufficiently appealing to the people. Therefore, I gave a title here. The title should look interesting, should look attractive. And we will try and see how we can defend it. And we have had problems in various research areas. Generally, science means this. We actually want to do things which are like this, which we think are today insurmountable. We want to surmount them. So I give start with an example here. So this is before Hillary and Tenzing climbed the Mount Everest. People must have thought, who can climb Mount Everest? It is impossible to go there. You know how to reach to the top. So you'll have to find ways to go to the top. And eventually they succeeded. Uh, this is an example of something you want to circumvent, surmount, which you thought earlier was insurmountable. There are many, many examples of this type in our life, and I want to show you some of those. And this is who would have thought that somebody will go to the moon and land on the moon? To think of that itself is something weird. But people did that, and you had a dream that okay, we want to land on the moon and you start working towards it and you achieved it. And Americans landed on the moon, of course, others also landed. When the Russians went on the, on the space, walked on the space, so many people and everybody thought that okay, well, it is only America and Russia and China, somebody else can do it. India cannot do this, we are so far behind. But lo and behold, we also did it almost. Almost, I want to say, I will be a little bit cautious. It is, uh, we are orbiting still, we are orbiting on, on the, on the, around the moon, but we just did not make to the last square, I mean the uh, few, two kilometers thing. But of course, it says that, okay, if you look at the graph of that Chandrayaan thing landing, they lost contact only around 400 meters, not really 2.1 kilometers as was said. 2.1 kilometers was the place where it is probably to change the track of its movement, but then the, it lost contact only around 400 meters. So we almost did it. So therefore, it is something which you thought it could not do it, but we did it. And what about here? Who would have thought that you can look at a person who is sitting some 10,000 kilometers away and you can talk to them and see everything that happens sitting in your room? So the world has become very small. So you don't need to travel such huge distances to go and see what is happening there, what is present there. And who is responsible for this, for this development. And we are very proud to say that this was an Indian who actually discovered, invented this idea, trick technique, wireless transmission. This was Jagadish Chandra Bose. And this was the crude equipment which he used in Calcutta to transmit over a few hundred meters, but then it was taken over by somebody else. Recognition was also given to somebody else, which was unfortunate. And, uh, and we have the mobiles and we have this as well. We can actually see this on the television screen, you can see this, right? So who would have thought, okay, you can see something which is so far away and in such fine details. You look at one square foot of that area. You can look at the Google Maps and then say one square foot you can see with that resolution, even less. You can eventually target and go and hit the, uh, uh, the windows. You have the missile system, targeted missile system. They can go and hit into the window of your room, sitting somewhere a few thousand kilometers away. 
So how would it, you know, we have heard stories of this in Mahabharata and Ramayana and things like this, the Astras, you know, the so-called Astras. Astras actually are guided missiles. They will go and target somebody, chase them. And these missiles are doing that basically. So you can see, therefore, what you thought is impossible is possible. You can make it possible and that is what is science. The science can do this. And there are many stories of this type and we would like to see here there is one more example. You are looking inside the body without cutting the body. Right? So the imaging, I mean this has happened both from the point of view of x-ray, x -ray, the CAT scans and the MRI scans. You are not doing anything to the person, completely harmless and you are able to see what is inside. Of course, you may say, how do you know it is correct? Okay, so you might say, well, you see something, how do you know it is correct? But then following this, you actually go and do some surgery and remove the extra tissue which is present, the cancer growth, things like that. You are able to see that and then cut it out afterwards, which proves that, okay, what you have seen is correct. So therefore, these are all things which, are, which you thought was impossible to do it, but you are able to do it. And that is what is the challenge in science. The challenge in science is what you think is impossible, you can do it and that is what is surmounting the insurmountable. There are many such stories. I am going to focus on one particular aspect of this which is what I work on. A lot of uh, for the la last several decades I have been working on particular uh, subject and there are many stories in that subject as well. This is what I want to show you today and this is on uh, st in, st in structural biology and especially using NMR, NMR technique. So here is a molecule protein, structure of the proteins. Once again here is so small, the protein is such a small molecule, you can't see this. No? You can't see this and here you are able to see this at the level of the atomic detail. How do you get this structure? So once again in a general public one might say this is impossible to see. How can you know what is the structure of the molecule? But there are ways, there are methods, technologies have developed and which will allow us to look at the protein structures and then we go and understand how the protein functions, what are the interactions of the proteins and what brings about the functions, what brings about malfunction, what brings about diseases and all of these things you are able to think by doing experiments in vitro. Of course, you do in vivo as well, but a lot of experiments are done in vitro in your test tube, in your laboratory and you are able to see many of these things in, and draw conclusions. Okay. Watson Crick discovered the double helix and of course they did not go into the body. They looked at the DNA fiber, fiber refraction data. From the fiber reduction they predicted the model and of course it is correct. And it is now able to explain a lot of your biological phenomena, replication and so on and so forth. So the whole of structural biology evolved from there. So therefore these are things, you are, the point is to ask questions which you think are very difficult currently. Ask questions of that type and then we will try to find a way. If you do not ask questions, there is no problem, question of finding a way. So therefore, the questions have to be of such a type that okay, you think it is impossible today, but we want to make it possible. So now I come to this one particular topic here, the NMR stories. There are many st uh, stories of this type in NMR as well. Okay. These are the people who actually made the main important contributions here. So, so here we have uh, Otto Stern. He discovered that nuclei have a magnetic moment. This was an experiment which he did in 1927-28, but then of course he got the Nobel Prize for it in 1943. And Rabi saw that okay, I should try and use this magnetic moment. Can I measure this magnetic moment? How to do it? How to do the, how to measure the magnetic moment? Nuclei is much a small entity and it has, it is a tiny magnet. It is a tiny magnet and how to measure its magnetic moment? It is not a bar magnet that you can might measure, you go into the general laboratory and measure the magnetic moment. It is a tiny magnet, nucleus. How to measure its magnetic moment? And he designed molecular beam experiments wherein you can actually find the resonance, absorption of energy under certain conditions which will allow him to measure the magnetic moment. So, Rabi also did these experiments in the 1930s, but of course it got recognized only later because of the war and things like that. So, he got the Nobel Prize in 1944, soon after this, one after the other, they got the two Nobel Prizes in physics. 
and then came application in condensed matter. Those ones in molecular beam experiments were in the gaseous phase. The people who used the condensed matter, these two people showed that okay, magnetic resonance can be done in the condensed matter in the liquid phase. Felix Bloch at Stanford, Purcell at MIT, these two people working six, at 6000 kilometers away and they independently discovered this phenomenon nuclear magnetic resonance experiment in the condensed phase and they got the Nobel prize also. All of these Nobel prizes were in physics, in the domain of physics. Okay? So, then so what is the experiment? What is the experiment here? Okay, so, what it requires is you need to have a magnet and you need to have a sample here in the, in, in the center of the magnet and need to have a coil here which supplies energy. And depending upon the magnetic field you have, energy is at a particular frequency. Therefore, you must produce that kind of a frequency for absorption of energy to take place. So, that is in radio frequency regime. So, depending upon what magnetic field you have, you may have radio frequency for 40 megahertz to 300 megahertz and things like that. Now, the idea was that okay, these nuclear magnets which are present, they tend to orient specifically with, uh, with respect to the magnetic field and when they orient differently with respect to the magnetic field, there is an energy separation between them and if you supply energy corresponding to the energy difference between these two levels, then there is absorption of energy and that is a signal. This is proportional, this frequency is proportional to the magnetic field strength here and with that you can actually measure the magnetic moment. So, absorption of energy frequency will tell you what is the magnetic moment of the nuclear because it is proportional to the magnetic moment and the strength of the magnetic field. Okay. Then this was going on in Stanford, people were trying to measure magnetic moments and then Felix Bloch wanted to measure the magnetic moment of proton in water, of proton, generally let me say proton. Now, he asked one of his postdocs who was S. S. Dharmati, he was an Indian, Indian postdoc. He asked him, why don't you measure, go and put a sample of water in the magnet and measure the resonance frequency and find the magnetic moment. But Dharmati was such, not such an obedient postdoc, he instead of putting water, he put alcohol. Maybe he was drinking alcohol, who knows. So, he put alcohol in the magnet and then instead of getting one signal, he got three signals. See, so Felix Bloch said, how can you get three signals? There is only one proton. It is only proton. Proton cannot have different magnetic moment. Magnetic moment has to be the same for every proton. But how is it you get three signals? But Dharmati said, no, I got three signals. You want to come and check, you check. However, he never believed it. Till the end, he never, this so many times they did, but he still never believed it. But they published a paper without Felix Bloch, and this was published, you see here, Arnold, Dharmati, and Packard. And that is the start of MNMR in chemistry and biology. This is the chemical shift. The chemical shift was discovered by this experiment. And you see what is chemical shift? So, here is what they said. See, nucleus is not a bare nucleus. It has a magnetic moment all right, which is fixed. Indeed, it is fixed. But it is not a bare nucleus. The nucleus has an electronic cloud around it. And therefore, you have to look at it in total. What is the effect of this electronic cloud around it? Once you apply a magnetic field, there will be currents in the electronic cloud, which will tend to oppose the externally applied magnetic field. Therefore, the field seen by the nucleus itself is not the same as what we have applied, but what is finally experienced by the nucleus. Therefore, what it, now it brings in another parameter. Firstly, the magnetic field that is applied externally. Secondly, the electronic cloud around the nucleus. And that means in different molecules, you can have different electronic clouds around the protons Therefore, they can in principle absorb energy at different frequencies. So, therefore, if you look at ethyl alcohol, which is what you put, there are three different protons, CH3, CH2, OH. All these three types of protons are different chemical environments, electronic environments, and therefore, they absorb energy at different places. Here is another example. If you take this small molecule here, 
This is called vinyl chloride for those who are in from the chemistry department. You can see there are three protons here and there is a chlorine atom here. The chlorine atom has the property of withdrawing electrons towards it. Therefore, it reduces the electron densities at these proton sites. The maximally affected one is this proton and then this will be affected, this will be affected. So, the result will be that the electron density around these three protons are going to be different. Therefore, the magnetic field seen by these three different protons is going to be different. Therefore, they absorb energy at three different frequencies. You have this neo B, then you have neo A and neo C. So, therefore, you get three different lines here for this simple molecule. Okay. And then this was the start as a set of applications in chemistry. And a lot of people worked on various kinds of molecules, try to understand the chemical shift as an indicator of the electronic environment around the particular nucleus. Depending upon what sort of a molecule you have, what is the electronic environment around it and they came out with a kind of a measure which is called as the ppm parts per million that is the frequency absorbed with respect to some reference compound. You measure with respect to some reference how much is the deviation from that reference frequency and you convert that into some sort of a unit called as the ppm. And then that ppm is very reflective of the electronic environment around that particular nucleus. And therefore, they got these tables here. You look at the protons here. If you have a that ppm range for the proton goes from 0 to 12, depending upon what kind of a structure you have in your molecule, you have the resonance frequencies appearing at different, uh, different ppm values. Olefinic protons here, aromatic protons, CONH2, RNH2, RCHOH, alpha protons, saturated protons and so on and so forth. Similarly, for the carbon, depending upon the carbon which you are looking at, notice here once more, which carbon? Carbon 12 is not an MR active. Carbon 12 does not have a magnetic moment. It is carbon 13. Carbon 13 one has to see, okay. In that case as well, you have various kinds of carbons here they absorb energy at different frequencies. And notice the range of the carbon frequencies here, whereas a proton goes from 0 to 12, this goes from 0 to 200 ppm. This is a very, very wide range of chemical shifts for carbons, <coughs> which means you have much better resolution dispersion in the, in the um, uh, signals. And you can actually count the number of signals in the carbon spectrum and say that the molecule has these many carbons. So, I, therefore, then you look at the fine structure with, as which we will see later that you can identify what sort of a carbon it is and you can determine the molecular structure. This was a boom for chemists. You synthesize a molecule and you put it in your magnet, you know what is the structure of the molecule. So, it became absolutely essential for any synthetic chemist to produce an NMR spectrum to confirm the structure what he has got, what molecule he has synthesized. Unless you produce an NMR spectrum, nobody will accept that okay, what you synthesize is the correct, what you wanted to synthesize and what you have got it. So, it became such an important technique. Now, then came another big bombshell and that is the coupling. You have this coupling, the protons are not isolated. All protons are not isolated, okay, they have magnetic moment all right, but in the neighborhood there are also some other protons and in the neighborhood there are also electrons which we said. Now, electrons also have a magnetic moment. So, therefore, there can be interaction between the magnetic moment of the nucleus and the magnetic moment of the electron and this, this interaction can relay through the structure of your molecule. From here to here it can relay and therefore, the, this magnetic moment can influence this magnetic moment and depending upon the orientations of these two, this way, this way, this way, this way, they will have different energies of absorption and that leads to what is called as the spin spin coupling. If I have one proton here and one proton here which absorb at different frequencies, then they will be interacting with each other produce two different lines depending upon the relative orientations of these two protons with respect to the magnetic field. Okay? So, this is called as the coupling constant here and this reflects in both the positions. This will have a structural information. Suppose I have a, another proton here then you will have two couplings, this proton will be coupled to this as well as to the other one, therefore it will be more splitting, therefore fine structure what you get is going to be important for the structure calculation. And this is now the latest 
or, or the modern spectrum of ethyl alcohol. What Dharmati showed you was three lines, three chemical shifts. Okay. Now you see such a fine structure individually. You have the CH3 group here, the CH2 group here and the OH group here. All of them are showing fine structures because of the coupling between these protons and these protons and this proton. So this fine structure actually tells you what sort of a group you have. The chemical shift is one thing and the fine structure is another thing which will tell you what sort of a structure you have in your molecule. Therefore, often it is now you when you go for an interview at somewhere, you say okay, here I have a formula and what sort of a spectrum it should produce. Now, if that formula produces many different kinds of um, um, structures, then you will have different NMR spectra for those and which will be used for identification of what sort of a molecular structure you have in the sample that is given to you. Okay. So, this was the old NMR spectrometer. This is how the NMR spectrometer was built in the early days and this is one of the very old spectrometers. And here is a magnet and the sample is kept here and this is where you actually do the measurement and you have uh, one whole room is required for this fully. Okay. This is an electromagnet and the, in the electromagnet you pass the current, there is a coil wrapped around uh, uh, iron something and you pass the current and depending upon the strength of the current you produce a magnetic field. Now, if this magnetic field has to be stable, which it should be, because unless it is stable, you will not have absorption of energy at one frequency. If the field changes, the frequency will change. Therefore, if you want to have absorption at one particular frequency, the stable magnetic field has to be stable. Now, if there is any fluctuation in your magnetic field, which can happen due to the variation in the current that is flowing through the coil, then of course, you will produce a mess of a spectrum. Therefore, it is very important that you have a stable magnetic field here and then to produce that you have lots of uh, designs to improve the homogeneity of your magnetic field inside the uh, magnet. So, you must in the place where your sample is sitting your magnetic field has to be uniform. Okay. And how much current can you pass through an electromagnet? You notice when you pass current through an electromagnet a lot of heat is produced okay. and this heat has to be removed. So, if you if it is not removed, it is going to heat up the magnet, it is going to heat up the coil, then you, all your experiments will go away. So, therefore, it is important to cool the magnet. So, you need a huge cooling system. Earlier you used to have water circulation, chilled water circulation to go around the magnet to cool the magnets and your power has to be stable. The electromagnets, the power has to be stable. If it is not the case, then of course, you have problem. So, that was a huge problem. And how much strength of the magnetic field you could get? You could get about 1 Tesla, or one, te 1 Tesla is 10 kilogauss. So, you can get 10 kilogauss, 20 kilogauss, 2 Tesla, 3 Tesla and not more. Beyond that you could not go. So, that was the limit because you cannot get much more current because if you produce more current, more heat, more cooling is required, stability is a problem. So, that was the challenge. So, therefore, they could not go much higher in that. And then the second thing that has to be done is, okay, you have resonances at various places, right? You have a chemical shift here, a chemical shift here and a chemical shift there. So, you found how to measure it, okay? Now, you keep the field constant and change the frequency slowly of your RF so that whenever you reach the condition of resonance, you will have a signal, okay? Now, either you can do that. Or you say I keep the frequency constant and I sweep the field so that whenever the magnetic field matches that particular frequency then I will have a signal. I will have a resonance condition satisfied and that is your NMR signal. The latter was easier to move the field was easier because what you have to do you have to simply change the current in your coil. So, the you keep changing the magnetic field strength and you get the signal. But then how fast you can do it? See every time you change the field, the energy levels will change. So, the nuclei will have to redistribute themselves between the two energy levels to reach equilibrium. And this will depend upon a certain parameter called as the relaxation time and this is extremely large. So, therefore, you have to sweep very, very, very slowly. Therefore, this was called as a slow passage experiment. So, you have to be in equilibrium with the energy levels always. 
So, therefore, every time you change the field, you have to wait enough time so that it reaches equilibrium, then only you can do the measurement. So, therefore, this slow passage experiments and it used to be like suppose you take a for a simple calculation, you sweep rate as 1 hertz per second. Suppose you do that, and then if you want to scan 1000 hertz, 1000 hertz is about 10 ppm on a 100 megahertz spectrometer. Okay? Now, if you want to do it at this rate, then it takes 16 minutes and 16 minutes is a long time of course, but then it becomes even worse when you have to do what is called a signal averaging. Why do you have to do signal averaging? Because the sensitivity itself is not very large because the radio frequency means energy suppression is very small, the population difference is very small, the signal intensity is proportional to the population difference, therefore the sensitivity is very low. But then what you can do is, okay, you scan it once, scan it again, scan it again, scan it again and add all of them. If you add all of them, then you can increase the signal by that many times as you add, but then you will also increase the noise by the square root of the number of times you add. Therefore, your signal to noise is proportional to the square root of the number of scans you add. So, if I want to increase the sensitivity from 16 minutes, I want to make it a factor of 10 more, then I will have to do 100 times and that is a huge amount of time. Okay? So, therefore, when you have a small amount of sample, the concentration is very small, then you want to get a good signal, then you will have to do it extremely slowly one and do it many times over and add them, but then you have a demand on the spectrometer. Magnet has to be stable for that long. So, if it has to be stable for 10 hours, you can see it is very demanding, it is very demanding. Where the power will be stable for that long? Most cities in the country, you will not have power stable for the 10 hours. Always voltage fluctuations here and there, okay, it's, it just goes off, then it does not. So, all the efforts which are put in is gone waste. So, therefore, that was a big challenge. Though signal averaging is number of sweeps co added, uh, okay, this, this is what I explained to you. And difficult to observe low abundance nuclei such as carbon 13 and nitrogen 15. And carbon 13, I mentioned to you, this is only 1.1 percent abundant. Rest of it is carbon 12, and carbon 12 is useless for NMR. Carbon 13 is what you read. Nitrogen 15 is 0.37 percent. Rest of it is nitrogen 14. Nitrogen 14, of course, has also a magnetic moment, but it leads to more complications. Nitrogen 15 is by and large the one which is used and that is only 0.37 percent. So, therefore, it is extremely difficult to observe such nuclei with this method. So, therefore, when you have a sample which is not soluble to more than few micrograms per ml or few hundred micrograms per ml, it becomes extremely difficult to study such molecules. There are many natural products or many drugs, those chemists who want to work with the drugs and things like that, there are many drugs which are not soluble in water or many other solvents. So, it is difficult to be high, get high concentrations and then if you do not have such things, then of course, it becomes difficult to observe this sort of spectra. Therefore, what people thought, well, NMR is not useful, useless is okay, fine, exciting, but then you have these problems. It has the limitations to how much you can apply, what sort of a molecules you can apply and how far you can go in real life. So, the thought is useless. So, what happened? Lot of the people who were working with NMR decided to quit and where did they go? They went into EPR, electron paramagnetic resonance. Why electron paramagnetic resonance? Electron also has a magnetic moment, but that magnetic moment is 2000 times higher than that of proton. Therefore, actually the sensitivity is very large. For the same magnetic field, you have much larger separation between the energy levels. Therefore, the sensitivity is very high. Therefore, let us go to EPR, electron paramagnetic resonance. Many people shifted, but then you see what happened. Another bombshell. This is what I call, these are called surmounting the insurmountable, these are all examples of that. And then you see what happened, pulse excitation, a bright individual called Richard Ernst, he, well, pulse excitation was known earlier, but he, he did Fourier transformation. There was a bright individual who said, I am not going to sweep the magnetic field, it is useless. I will keep the magnetic field constant, apply all the frequencies in one go. But then do you have so many transmitters, if you want to put so many transmitters 
for each one of them at separate frequency, then you need to have so many transmitters. No, he said no, that is not practical. If you want to put 1000 transmitters, it will occupy the whole hall like this. No, that is not practical. But then what is to be done? Then you do this. It is called pulse excitation. You take the same radio frequency, you do not apply it continuously. Apply it for a short period, short period like 5 microseconds or 10 microseconds. So, you start the RF here is on, then you switch it off. <coughs> this process actually generates a whole lot of frequencies which is indicated here. So, this generates a whole lot of distribution of frequencies with different amplitudes. Okay? This is the profile of the frequency generated by this operation. What it means? This is actually a Fourier transform of this frequency spectrum. This time domain spectrum, this time domain function what we have here is a Fourier transform of this frequency domain spectrum and this is what was used by Richard Ernst. Or say now you see I have all this frequency generated in one go. I have applied the pulse for 5 microseconds, in that 5 microseconds I have generated all these frequencies. Of course, they all have different amplitudes here, but I want to use those with a similar amplitude because the excitation profiles have to be the same for all of them. Therefore, I am not going to use all of them, but I will only use this much. I will only use this little bit around that which is sufficient for me. Because you see look here what is here, this 0 comes at 1 by tau. So, if this is tau is 1 microsecond, this is 10 to the power 6, 1 megahertz range, 1 megahertz is the quite a large range. So, therefore, this will be few kilohertz, few kilohertz is enough. I say 1000 hertz earlier. So, if you go to higher magnetic field 5000 hertz, 10000 hertz, it is still few kilohertz, it is very much possible. So, I can choose only this. So, I put a filter here that to throw away all of this and pick up only this little bit on the top which has a flat amplitude profile. So, that I apply the same power to all the frequencies, all the resonance positions. So, that the excitation is uniform. All those are excited uniformly because that is important. That unless there is uniform excitation, the intensities of the lines will not be comparable. So, you must have uniform excitation and which is done by selecting a small portion from there. Okay. What else this pulse does? Okay, you applied this, but how do you know which, ones, which are the ones which are relevant for you? Which are there present in your sample? Okay, you applied the pulse, it generated megahertz frequencies, kilohertz frequencies, but how do you know which are relevant? Okay, then you look at the response. Now, what does the pulse do to the magnetic moment? And further the detailed analysis will tell you that if you have an equilibrium magnetization which is along the magnetic field axis, the magnetic field axis is along the z axis, equilibrium magnetization if it is oriented along that, then a pulse rotates this magnetization out of this z axis and brings them into the transverse plane. So, you can control this how much it can rotate and that will be controlled by the length of this pulse how long you apply whether it is a 2 microsecond, 3 microsecond and that depends on the power you use for the RF. This is the amplitude, this is the amplitude of the RF which means it is the power related to the power. So, this depends defines how much is the rotation angle. So, you can rotate the magnetization out of the z axis into the transverse plane, but this is not the equilibrium situation. Now, the pulse is gone, once the RF is gone the system has to go back to equilibrium, it has to go back to the z axis. So, when it will go to the z axis, how does it do? It goes like this, you start here, then uh, during the next tau t time period, it will start revolving like this and eventually recover back to the z axis. And when it is revolving like this in the transverse plane, it is the rotating magnetic, magnetic moment. The rotating magnetic moment will induce voltage. Okay? So, therefore, it is exactly the opposite of what we had with the chemical shift. So, you have a rotating magnetic moment, it will induce a voltage. So, you put a detector here, it will record the voltage. Therefore, whichever frequency is going which is relevant to you, you will get an induced voltage only from that. Therefore, this is automatic filtering process. You excited large number of frequencies all right, but the detection system is an automatic filter. Automatic filter which gives you the signal here and if there are more than one frequencies, there will be two different kinds of uh, uh, inductions here, this is called nuclear induction okay? and 
you get a profile which is a superposition of the word signals coming from the individual frequencies. I have shown here two, but there can be 10, there can be 100, whatever. Okay? So, you get here a so called free induction decay and this, this is now obviously the Fourier transform of your frequency spectrum. So, this time domain signal what you get here is the Fourier transform of your spectrum. Therefore, this operation gives you the NMR spectrum. Now, how much time it took? Excitation took 5 microseconds or maybe 10 microseconds and the FID which you are collecting the data here, you collect it for few hundred milliseconds. That is all. The one scan is you have excitation for microseconds and 200 milliseconds for the detection. Well, now if you want to do signal averaging, you can do it many times over. Okay, you can allow some time for it to recover, you give let us say 1 second or half a second for it to recover back to equilibrium and after that you apply the pulse again, allow it to collect it over and over and over again. Now, in the time you can do that slow passage, you can do 100 times more, 1000 times more. Okay? So, and that is what Richard Owens did and look at what he got. And this is the continuous wave spectrum or the slow passage experiment of this molecule. Could you see any signals here? Hardly any. There are some signals here, ok fine. And this is in 500 seconds. In the same 500 seconds, he got this spectrum of the same molecule. In the because he collected 500 times. 500 impulse responses of one, sec one second length. Okay? Now, when he, I want, there, there is a message to learn here, I want to tell you, this is a story, this is, Richard Ernst sent this for publication, it was rejected, three times rejected from the top journals, even normal journals. They said, okay, what are you talking about here? It was like the Felix Bloch rejecting Dharmati. So, he said, okay, I can't believe you. They said, they can't believe this. The spectrum has to be like this. <laughs> How do you get a spectrum like this? You have some impurities in your, in your sample. But then so many people did after that and, and got, got this over and then understood the whole theory. Then of course, it became clear that this is real and this was a major revolution. In fact, this is what led to the Nobel Prize to Richard Ernst. Of course, he did something else afterwards also, but this was the major breakthrough and people came back. Those who went are now back. So, back into NMR because the information you are getting from the NMR is so huge. Okay? Every proton is a monitor for you in your molecule. Electron, what does it give? There is one unpaired electron, it will give environment around that one unpaired electron. But here you have every proton is a monitor for your molecule. So, so much information. So, back. So, that is, that is again an example of surmounting the insurmountable. Okay. Now, this is the Fourier transform NMR spectrometer. Now, much looking much neater here, of course, the elect, it is still the electromagnet. It is not, it is not the, any other mag, see electromagnet. It has this limitation with respect to this, but here it is the Fourier transform. Okay. All operations, the computers place. Now, we need computers there. Because you need to control 1 microsecond, 2 microsecond, 3 microseconds and collect it for few hundred milliseconds. Fourier transformation done on the computer, digital Fourier transformation, digitally done. So, you need the computer. All the computer controls came in and this was the uh, spectrometer. But still it did not, well it addressed the sensitive issue to very large extent. But what is the other way to increase the sensitivity? Increase the magnetic field strength. 60 megahertz is very small magnetic field. Can we go to 1000 megahertz? Okay. 100 times, 10 times more, 600 megahertz is 10 times more. 100 megahertz to 1000 megahertz is 10 times more. Can I go that far? But the electromagnet can never do it. Because you need to apply so much current. Several hundreds of amperes of current you will have to pass through. And which no coil can take it and of course, so much heat will be generated and no power st stability will be there to that extent. So, once again a problem, you know what you do? How to increase the strength of the magnetic field? Then came the major discovery, superconducting magnets. Superconducting magnets was the solution. But to make superconducting magnets is not easy. Okay? Superconducting magnets, if you look at what superconducting magnets 
are made up of here are the engineers you know this is the thing for, for the engineers the engineers innovation created all of this how to get this so here you have a magnet now you look at how the magnet looks the magnet looks like this with the cylinder here which has the coil this is the mag the mag the main magnetic field is generated here it is inserted in helium because superconductivity means it has to be in liquid helium so you have to have liquid helium magnet is inserted in liquid helium and this is the nitrogen tank here it is surrounded by liquid nitrogen because all this insulations have to be there proper insulation so that the helium doesn't evaporate you need to maintain that okay then there is vacuum here so that once again insulation has to be proper helium should not evaporate now look at this what is the superconducting magnet design you have various other coils which are present to control the magnetic field strength and this is the main magnetic field where the sample goes and sits here this is the place where the sample sits okay now where is the challenge now we'll cut open the magnet here this is your coil this is the coil which generates magnetic field okay now what is the property of the superconducting coil superconducting coil has zero resistance right so that's superconductivity zero resistance which means it doesn't generate heat okay and therefore you can pass current very high current you can pass so how much current can you pass that depends on how many turns of this you can have and how many turns of the superconducting wire now superconducting wire how it is prepared you can you cannot imagine a 600 megahertz spectrometer the magnetic field has superconducting wire of the length of several kilometers how do you generate this several kilometers of superconducting wire wrapped around in a, such a small space is like dna wrapping around inside your micron cell how does it wrap itself so therefore here it is the coil several kilometers of superconducting wire is wrapped around how do you generate this and that is here you see you take a copper wire because superconducting wire there is zero resistance right always the current takes the path of zero resistance so you have 1 cm carbon uh, sorry copper wire and you drill holes into this drill holes 60 holes or 128 holes through each of these hole you pass the superconducting wire and each one of them is separate okay now when you pass current the current will flow only through the superconducting wire and not through the copper wire because here the resistance is zero why it will go to the copper now the other challenge is how do you generate such kilometers length of wire which is not broken anywhere it has to be continuous otherwise your circuit is not complete it has to be continuous wire but you have, therefore you have to join these are the secrets you produce small small pieces of superconducting wire and join them with some technique still nobody tells you what the technique is these are all patented techniques okay and therefore not many companies can do it earlier it used to be only oxford which was doing it and slowly slowly every individual invented themselves the broker has taken over now broker only manufactures all the spectrometers so these coils are joined in a very special way and then make long long wires and then they are this whole copper wire is wound around or this small piece now and then you have several liters of liquid helium then you insert this in the liquid only when it is inside the liquid helium it is superconducting otherwise it is not so if the superconductivity gets lost then all of this helium will evaporate the current will just dissipate then you can put here hundreds of amperes of current through this coil and therefore you can generate high magnetic field today you have 1.2 gigahertz spectrometer and that also sits in a small place like this you don't need a huge room okay now that is another major challenge which was overcome by the superconducting technology superconducting magnet technology this is a superconducting magnet and this is uh, how you put the sample in it goes and sits inside here and this is the electronics here and you collect your data here simple so small you compare this with the electromagnets what happened right so therefore at that time one could not have imagined anything of this sort 
So, this is a big accomplishment to improve the technology. Okay. So, now that is so far as the methodology with regard to the magnets, the technology and then. Now, we will come to the questions of applications. What sort of applications can we generate? What sort of applications we, we can en envisage? So, okay. Now, protein structure. I mentioned to you about the proteins. I said you cannot look at the proteins. Right? It is not visible to you. But you want to know what is the structure. So you understand its function. How to determine the structure. X-ray crystallography was known. X-ray crystallography was the one which was used for determining the structures of molecules. Once again, that is again a great technological innovation. So, and that is, and here for the NMR, it was considered, NMR cannot do protein structure determination. It does not have that much of sensitivity, impossible. X-ray crystallography was the only method which is available structure determination. Indeed, it was there for 50 years, it was so. But then came the revolution in the 1970s. The 70s and the early 80s, they saw the revolution in NMR with regard to that. And that came, I will show you how it came. And this is the proton spectrum of a protein called lysozyme. Okay? This is 130 amino acid residues long. And you see how many signals are here? You cannot even count them. <coughs> now, if you want to determine the structure of the molecule, you must be able to identify each resonance as belonging to this particular proton or this particular carbon and things like that and then establish some correlations between them so that you can calculate the structure of the molecule. But how do you assign these individual signals to individual protons? It is impossible. Therefore, people said, okay, this is useless. So far as biology is concerned, it is out of question. Structural biology means X-ray crystallography only. Okay. Then came this bombshell again. And this is two-dimensional NMR. Two-dimensional NMR, they said, okay, why should I restrict myself to only one dimension? Why can't I go into the second dimension? How is it possible? The foundation of this was laid in the Fourier transform NMR itself. So, if you look at the Fourier transform NMR, you applied an RF pulse and you detect the signal FID as a function of time. But you notice, excitation and the detection are separated in time, they are not simultaneous. And the FID consists of a superposition of all the signals. So, therefore, whether I collect the FID from time point 0 or time point here or time point here, it does not matter. All the information is still present. So, I can delay the acquisition of the data after the application of the pulse. Now, if I delay it, I get some time slot, time window. During the time window, I can do various kinds of manipulations. I can do the manipulation. If I do the manipulation, and that is how the two-dimensional NMR came into existence. You see here, the, the excitation happens here and detection happens here. In between, I do all these manipulations. You introduce another time variable here and another manipulation here to transfer information from this time portion to this time portion and repeat this experiment several times incrementing this time evolution period here and collecting the data here every time and do this mixing here, mixing transfers information from here to here as a consequence of all of that what you get? You get a two dimensional spectrum. The information that is present in the one dimensional spectrum, what is the information present? Information present is yeah, the resonance frequency is one thing, but these various resonance frequencies belong to certain protons which are interacting with each other. If I can figure out which protons are interacting with each other, I have the structural information about that. And that is what is done in the two-dimensional experiment. You display the correlations between the protons or any other nucleus on the plane. Now, it is not just along one dimension. Use the two dimension. Use the plane to display the correlation information between the protons onto the plane. So, that information now comes in the form of these peaks which are called as off-diagonal peaks or the cross peaks. See here, this is the two dimensional, one of the very old two dimensional spectrum, it is so called nosy spectrum. Do not worry about what nosy means, but I am just going to tell you what is this information present here. This is the proton axis here, the proton axis here and this is the so called one dimensional spectrum which lies along the diagonal. And you have so many frequencies, so many peaks which are present here. I said these peaks represent correlations between protons. They are coupled to each other in some way. So, in this experiment, these protons if they are close by in space, you see a peak. 
If they are far away, more than five angstroms, you don't see a peak. So therefore, if you have these those many peaks, you can say each peak identifies a proton pair which are shorter than five angstroms. So you count all of these peaks, identify all of these peaks, and then you can calculate. Therefore, what is the pairwise distribution of distances in your in your molecule, which means it is a structural information. Therefore, this spectrum is called the fingerprint of the structure of the molecule. See, if your molecule folds, the protein folds in this manner, these ones come close by, then you will see a correlation between these protons and that is indicated here. If you have four protons looking at various positions along the sequence, along the sequence and depending upon the way the protein chain folds, if these two protons come close by, you will see a correlation here. If the protein chain folds like this, you see a correlation between these two. If it folds like this, you see a correlation between these two. Therefore, by identifying all of these correlations here, you have an information as to what is the nature of the protein fold, the three dimensional structure of the molecule. Okay? So, therefore, now it is possible. NMR can also give you the structure. Initially, there was a lot of opposition for this interpretation, but then subsequently everybody falls in line. Every time you do something new, there is always an opposition. Take it for it, granted. Wherever you do something new, there is always a position. Criticism, because intrinsically we are not used to accepting things which are not uh, conventional. Okay? We, we want to do, we follow the same path, but a revolutionary will always do something different. So, so that is why I said, okay, you want to surmount, insurmountable. So now, this is how the strategy was evolved. You have this protein structure here. You measure the interproton distances by these uh, various uh, things here, and you also measure the coupling constants, which produces information about the torsion angles here. And using these two inputs, you can calculate the structure of the molecule. And you have here indicated here the so-called uh, distance-based structure calculation. You get by quantitating the dist of these peaks, peak intensities. The peak intensity is proportional to the distance, as I said is proportional to the inverse of sixth power of the distance. So, if a distance is more than 5 angstroms, you do not see a peak. But a peak, if the proton pair is 2 angstrom support or 2.5 angstrom support, that peak is stronger than the one which is 3.5 or 4 or 4.5. So, for the quantifying this structure uh, by the intensities, you calculate what should be the approximate distance between the two protons. So, the, then what you say, well, I do not want to say it is exactly 3.5, but I will say it is between 3 and 3.7. So, I will give a range, give a certain range. But if I generate thousands of these ones, even though there is a range, if I generate thousands of these ones, then there is sufficient information to calculate a unique structure. This is called as a distance geometry and that is shown here. You start with various kinds of initial structures of the molecules. Now, this is all on the computer you have generated a distance constraint set, distance constraint set for proton pairs, thousands of them and you are given that constraint to the computer to calculate a structure which is consistent with all of those distance constraints you have. You start with various initial structures, why do you have to do that? You do not want to be biased by the, your initial structure. It may go into the local minimum, then it may not be able to come out. Therefore, you want to start with the different initial structures, so that you do not have a bias of the initial structure. And then you put in those constraints, put in the distance geometry algorithm, you can see finally, you get the same structure. And this was the structure which was obtained by Kurt Wittrich in the 1980s. And that was the starting point for NMR structure determination. Again, it was challenged. They said, okay, no, it, how do you know it is correct? How do you know it is correct? Therefore, there was a competition between a crystallographer and, and Kutwitrich. And the crystallographer was, I think it was Huber in, uh, in, in Germany. They said, okay, well, we are going to do independently the structure of the same molecule, not talking to each other. Same molecule, not talking to each other, we will do the structure of the same molecule. Lo and behold, they got the same structure. And then the confidence built and that is how it has now become history. Okay? So, you have structures determined and these two gentlemen therefore, got the Nobel prizes. Richard Ernst got in 1991 for the development of Fourier transform NMR and two dimensional NMR. 
and Kurt Wittrich in 2002 for protein structure determination. And now, well, the life is much harder. You want to be ambitious, you want to go more and more, complicated. Now, here is a two dimensional, earlier I showed you one two dimensional spectrum, there is a nosy, and now here it is two dimensional spectrum again, but you see the number of peaks here. Again, it is insurmountable. How do I analyze this? This is so many peaks over there, so many peaks, how do I analyze these individual peaks? How do I quantify them? There is so much of overlap in this area. How do I quantify these intensities to calculate the structure? Therefore, you need to do something else. What do you do? Either you increase the magnetic field so that the separation increases, but then there is a limit how much you can go. Remember, a 600 megahertz may cost you like 8 crores, 9 crores or 10 crores or something and you go to 1000 megahertz, it will cost you 45 crores. So, it is not linearly proportional, the cost is not linearly proportional. So, you cannot afford it. So, therefore, what do you do? Well, try and see if you can use other nuclei. You are doing so much, so far you are only doing proton. Can I use carbon 13? Can I use nitrogen 15? But then carbon 13 is only 1 percent. Nitrogen 15 is only 0.37 percent. How do I use this? Then biologists came in. Biologists came in, said, okay, we will produce proteins which are uniformly labeled enriched by carbon 13 and nitrogen 15. You grow the cells in media which contain ammonium chloride nitrogen 15 label and glucose C13 label and that will take in and label every carbon, every nitrogen with N15. So, you have 100% abundance now. Okay, one problem solved. Then what? It will increase the complexity. The, you have not solved the complexity problem yet. You address the sensitivity issue by dispersing them in a different, uh, using different nuclei. Then, okay, the challenges. I am still showing you the challenges here. Okay, this was taken from Dobson's uh, article. By the way, I do not know how many of you know Dobson died recently. So, he, he, he died of cancer and this was, uh, I mean what are, the, what are the challenges in protein NMR, in the protein world. So, you have a molecule which is synthesized and comes out of the ribosome in an unfolded manner and it has, its fate is undetermined, it can go to the folded state here or it can get degraded or aggregate here, it goes through the intermediates, the intermediates themselves can disordered aggregate or ordered aggregate and they can want fibrils. These fibrils are responsible for diseases and these proteins which are so called native proteins are responsible for functions. They may aggregate here for fibers or form a crystal, but now we also have other kind of structures known as intrinsically unfolded proteins. These ones will never fold to this. These are intrinsically unfolded, they are functionally relevant. How are they functionally relevant? Because they interact with various interactors. Whenever they interact, they adopt a different fold, different structure, they are able to perform many different functions. And now you want to address all of these. So far, we are only looking at small protein, small molecule. Now, you looked at a little bit more complex system and okay, you want to think of higher magnetic field or you think of carbon 13, nitrogen 15, but still how do you use this all together? And the challenges were further like this that you want to go from 5 kilodalton monomers to megadalton multimers. You want to go there because your fibrils are megadaltons in size. And then you want to increase the speed. Earlier when Kurt Wittrich solved the structure, it was few years for one structure. Few years is too long and the biologists actually come out with the sequencing, you know the genome sequencing. You get a genome sequence in one, one week now. There are so many proteins which are coming by and you want to understand the structures all of these. How can you afford to spend two years for calculating one structure? Impossible. So, you want to go from here's years to hours. And then you have 3D structures, dynamics and interacts. The molecules are not stable. They are not actually static, not stable. They are stable. They are not static. They are dynamic. How do you measure these dynamics? How fast they are rotating? How fast they are tumbling? Is there internal motion? Is the internal motion important for function? How do we characterize this? First of all, looking at the molecule itself was a challenge. Now, you want to look at their motions and how fast quantitate them as to picosecond motion, nanosecond motion, microsecond motion, millisecond motion, all of them different implications for the structure and function of the molecule. 
So you want to characterize all of this. Okay? And then you have misfolding and aggregation. Misfolding leads to diseases. And how does the misfolding occur? Try to understand the folding pathway. Okay, can you intercept this folding pathway and see that okay, it folds in the proper manner only. Okay, and then as I said, these are the challenges once more. You want to acquire the data faster from the NMR point of view. You want to improve the resolution in the spectra to improve the uh, quality of the spectrum. Okay, this is an example to show example what you can achieve by using another nucleus. Okay, earlier I showed you a diagonal spectrum and you have cross peaks here and there. Now I do not want to use two protons, I will use proton on one axis and nitrogen on another axis. So now I have only the cross peak area, I do not have the diagonal, I only have the cross peak area which is important for me. That is the information carrier. Now if I have this kind of a proton nitrogen correlation spectrum for every protein, how many peaks I expect? This is the one bond correlations, these are NHs, all the amide protons produce a peak. Every amide proton produces me one peak. So you count the number of peaks here. Look at the already the separation that has happened. Using the nitrogen 15 chemical shift here, you have resolved all the peaks onto the plane. You count the number of peaks and it will tell you how many amino acids are there in your molecule. And this is sufficient space here. There is sufficient space in the, in the two dimensional plane. So therefore, you can generally get good resolution and good dispersion. And that is an important achievement. You can do the same for carbon and the carbon chemical shifts, these are the alpha carbons here, these are the betas, the gammas and the deltas and so on and so forth and you have all these side chain carbons which are present here which will allow you to identify the amino acid spin system by looking at the correlations. Okay. So you used the nitrogen 15 and carbon 13 chemical shifts to disperse the information in the two dimensional plane. Of course, it is still quite overlapping in this area and what do we do here? Okay, let us do this. You did combine both. You combine nitrogen and carbon. Combine nitrogen and carbon produce a three dimensional spectra or four dimensional. Why restrict to two dimensions? Just as we did the two dimensional experiment, we can do the same thing in three dimensions and four dimensions. And these are called as a triple resonance experiments, heteronuclear experiments. You try to correlate the proton, the nitrogen and the carbons here. The same here, proton, the nitrogen and the carbon here. So many different ways you can do these correlations. Now we have therefore generated a whole set of experiments and this is where the physicists come into the picture. And all this has to be done by physicists, well physical chemists, physical chemists or physicists because you have to work out the spin dynamics. How when you do a particular experiment, how the spins respond to various pulses which you apply, how do they recover and how do I correlate all these different things at the same time. Okay. So these were uh, major developments in the, in the 1990s. Here is an illustration how it will help us. Okay. Now here you have a proton spectrum. This is the proton-proton correlation spectrum. Okay, schematic, this is the schematic here and this one shows you typically if you have an amide proton, how many protons it is connected to? Usually it is connected to the C alpha proton and not much more than that. So you will have through 2, 3 peaks present generally in this spec, but you have here 10 peaks in this area at one particular amide chemical shift. Amide chemicals you have 10 different peaks. Now therefore obviously it means that there is a significant overlap in the amide ke proton chemical shift. So what I do now, I use the nitrogen 15 chemical shift to see proton nitrogen correlation. It turns out that I get three peaks which means there are at least three amino acids here and therefore I get three different N15 chemical shifts. Now you pull this spectrum using this chemical shift along the third axis. So this generates a three dimensional spectrum. So three dimensional spectrum along this axis is nitrogen 15. Now these 10 peaks are now distributed in three different planes. Here three, four here and two there, one missing. Okay. So nine peaks, three, four, seven plus two, nine. Now these ones have to be further separated. You can use a carbon 13. You can use the carbon 13 to displace them onto individual planes. So now we have four different peaks on four different planes. Therefore, all of them are well separated. Proton, nitrogen, carbon, 
proton, two axis proton, one axis nitrogen, one axis carbon. So, you have a four dimensional spectrum. So, completely resolved peaks, now it does not matter if you have 100,000 peaks, you can still separate them. Therefore, you can go to larger and larger sizes of the molecules. So, your ambition is closer to be satisfied. And lo and behold, what you got? As a result of all of this, here it was the starting used to get one or two years to get one or two structures and now you see how many structures you have got. It is still growing of course. And the speed with which of course, at this point the rate at which it is obtained is perhaps one week or two weeks for one structure it is still, because it is still not enough. As I said we want to go to hours and eventually minutes. Why do you want to go to minutes? Minutes is where you have to do kinetics. If you want to do the kinetics of a particular molecule, study the kinetics of folding or interaction of something, you want to go to the minutes time scale or even seconds time scale. And we, are, we want to approach there. Can we do that? Okay. And then the second challenge is how do you handle the intrinsically unfolded proteins? The intrinsically unfolded proteins have this problem. You have a folded protein which has well resolved peaks here. So, you can count the number of peaks, this is the proton nitrogen 15 correlation spectrum and this is the unfolded protein as an illustration of intrinsically unfolded protein here. Okay, you see the chemical shift dispersion along the amide proton axis is lost. Okay. So, this is lost here. So, therefore, what do we do? But fortunately, dispersion along this axis is retained. Therefore, we can use this nitrogen 15 more than once. Earlier, we used once. In the four dimensional spectrum schematic which I showed you, I use N15 along one axis. But now I want to use more than once. Just as we use proton on two axis, I want to use nitrogen 15 on two axis because I have a better dispersion here. And this led to development of a huge number of three dimensional experiments using nitrogen 15 and this is one of those. And this is called as HNN and that has amide protons along this axis nitrogen 15 along this axis, nitrogen 15 along this axis. And what is the information content here? The information content is, is the following that you have a three dimensional spectrum. If you took a cross section at this particular N15 chemical shift here, you see three peaks and these appear at three different nitrogen chemical shifts and one particular amide proton chemical shift. And this amide proton chemical shifts correlates to the nitrogen 15 of the same residue to the previous residue and the following residue. If I is the residue which you are talking about, it shows a correlation to I, I minus 1 and I plus 1. So, three sequential residues are connected already. Now, what you do? You go to the next plane, go here or okay, before that let me show you this. If you took an orthogonal cross section here, at the same N15 chemical shift as you took here, then you will see three peaks which are the three peaks filtered out from your proton nitrogen 15 correlation spectrum. These three same peaks which are present here on this map, you have them at different amide proton chemical shifts. This is the typical HSQC spectrum, the N15 proton correlation spectrum, right? But this is the filtered out, only those three peaks have come out. So, therefore, this is called as a triplet filter through the HSQC. Therefore, you can walk along the polypeptide chain. Okay, you know the nitrogen 15 planes. You have to go from here to here, go from here to here, here to here, here to here. You can keep jumping. So, you can walk along the polypeptide chain rather easily. Notice also that these have different signs. If it is positive, these two are negative. They have different signs. Okay. And then you have another experiment which is called HNCN. This shows a particular directionality. So, if you took the same cross sections as we did before, you have two peaks here, one i and i plus 1 and on this one you see i and i minus 1, which means by looking at this, you know which direction you are going. Earlier when you did not know which direction you are, which one is i minus 1, which is i plus 1, how do I know? But I know here which is the direction. Therefore, if I am walking like this, I know which direction I am walking. A third important point to be noticed here that this triplet which you have seen the pattern I said the positive and negative peaks, but interestingly it turns out that depending upon the glycines, the glycines generate different kinds of patterns. Whenever there is a glycine, it produces a different kind of a pattern. If I have x, z or g, x, z, it has a different pattern. You look at this comparisons here. 
negative negative positive this is positive positive negative okay and similarly you have different kinds of patterns if you have ggz and zgg this kind of a sequence you have here negative positive positive you have a negative positive negative so what is the implication of this if you are walking along the polypeptide chain then you see the patterns of the pH you can identify where you are in your chain okay so you start from one particular residue from p to or g to x to y to z and things like that and come to a g the moment you hit a g i should get a pattern belonging to this so therefore sequential assignment of the individual resonances walking through this experiment becomes extremely easy and you see in this experiment this is a kind of a projection of the hncn experiment this is f2 f3 plane and you see only those peaks which belong to the glycines and the residues following them an orthogonal cross section of the same produces the same hsqc peaks plus the ones which are the neighbors therefore in this one experiment i can obtain complete assignment can walk through the entire polypeptide chain in this one experiment and how much time does it take to record this spectrum half an hour this spectrum takes only half an hour a projection of course well resolved peaks you have particular correlations present here this shows how you walk through the polypeptide chain here start from here go to the negative peak the positive peak the negative peak the positive peak and then again a positive peak why positive positive here because there's the glycine you hit the glycine therefore the pattern changes and from here you go to the negative once again the next one is both are negative that's because of the glycine here so therefore this will tell you that okay, you are walking in the right way okay and then you have the negative negative then positive negative positive negative uh, therefore you can walk along the chain much more easily and this is basically a blow up of some of, of this portion here okay that was the beginning i declared a lot more developments and you have all of these developments which are indicated here several 3d experiments projection experiments and dual receiver experiment all of this i'm not going to go through all of that but point is that whole lot of developments pulse sequences nmr experiments have happened and the consequence is the following and you automatically assign these individuals by developing a software called as atoba and this was done by our uh, well kumar and then i had incident i should tell you tell you another story here who can contribute this so i had a a project student bioinformatics bioinformatics students who came from pune okay she was her name is aditi aditi borkar okay she came to me she wants to do a one year project i said what do you want to do she said i don't know any nmr <laughs> i said what but why do you come to me so if then she said okay no i want to work with you because my bosses teachers are told you go you go there and work there i said okay what can you do ah i said i have bioinformatics i can do software development very good i said okay computer computer specialist i said look here is the protocol which is very straight forward to analyze why don't you write a software to do this and you can't believe it within 6 months she, she produced the protocol she produced the software atoba we call it atoba and this is all this whole set of experiments you use some minimum backbone amide and oes and you get the backbone fold in two days including data collection analysis everything you get backbone fold in two days well even more recently this is one of my postdoc currently at cbs and he developed these experiments called as non uniform sampling best hnn non uniform sampling best hncoc we don't want to go into the details of these experiments but this is a 3d experiment which is recorded in 1 hour 29 minutes earlier it used to take say 18 19 hours without with the best hnn without best it will take 40 hours now with this combination it is done in 1 and 1/2 hours this experiment 3d experiment recorded in 28 minutes this 3d experiments recorded in 22 minutes these three experiments are sufficient for you to obtain the entire backbone assignment complete backbone assignment so 2 hours in total will give you the complete backbone assignment with the chemical shifts to calculate the structure using this algorithm called rosetta which was developed by admax in group and you have the structure calculated and it's very good compare that with the crystal structure here rmsd is 0.93 angstrom 
So, where we have moved from 2 years to 2 hours, we still have to go further. We have to go to minutes time scale that is still insurmountable. We have to surmount that. There is still a thing which one has to do. Okay, now this was this was the demonstration of how the Autobo works and what she did was she took data from the BMRB, PDB data bank and used the chemical shifts which are there, synthesized the spectrum and gave it to the computer to assign the individual peaks. Look at the success rate, extremely good. Therefore, there is absolutely no problem and unfortunately she left, she left for PhD and uh, then I talked to uh, our, the Brooker engineer. The Brooker engineer was Detlef. Detlef was the one who was interacting with us very well. And I told him, look, here is such a simple experiment. This will help. This is a software. You implement it on your spectrometer so that you can sell it well. Many people will buy your spectrometer. You put it on your spectrometer as a button. Just as you do the experiment, put a button there so that it will use the assignments also. Those experiments are done. He said, yeah, very well, I will do it. But he died. <laughs> what a tragedy. So, that is a, yeah, so it still remains hanging. So, somebody has to surmount it. All right. Now, we change the topics. We go to the protein folding. Okay. You start, you want to understand how the proteins fold. Okay. So, here is the protein folding funnel. Typically, one understands in this manner. This is the reaction coordinate here. This is the energy here. And this is the folded protein and this is the unfolded protein here and lot of degrees of freedom, lots of conformations and all of them fluctuate very rapidly, interconnote very rapidly. As the protein starts to fold, they will move down the funnel and eventually lead here. But as they move down the funnel, they also slow down in the motions and they eventually reach here when there is a stable structure. The new contacts are made, some new old contacts are removed and things like that and eventually reach here. To approach this problem, so we started doing this with unfolded protein here, slowly fold it by reducing the urea concentration from 8 molar, 7 molar, 4, 6 molar and so on and so forth. Eventually, you come down to 0 molar which is a folded protein and this is the spectrum of SUMO. SUMO is the one which we use as a target. Of course, we have used several other proteins also after that. And here is the equilibrium transition down the funnel. This is unfolded state and you start coming down here. Some structures are getting formed but the motions are getting slowed. The helix is getting formed here, another this helix is extended, new helices are formed and of course, so the motions are slowed down further because remember as it starts to fold as contacts are made and the contacts are made the motion will not be that free anyway. So, therefore, it has to slow down and that will reflect in your relaxation times and that is showing in the pink color here and, and the red color and some propensities you see come down to 4 molar, this helix is removed, this is gone and go to 3 molar everything is removed, even these helices are gone. Go to 2 molar, now you get new ones here, new helix here, new helix here, the beta sheets are formed. And at this point you see what happens is that the ones which have disappeared, all of those regions which are close by in the folded structure. So, there is this dynamics which is going on, the, the protein is folding and unfolding and folding and unfolding that structure which is going on. Because of that the peaks vanish and then of course, you have the all the structures are lost. What is the message? The message is when the protein starts to fold, it is kinetically driven. It is not, th it is not thermodynamically driven. Whichever way it goes initially, it goes there. But then if it is not the stable, it is not the native state, this contact had to be removed. These structures have to be removed and that is what is happening here. So, the protein never folds in a monotonous manner. It is initially kinetically driven and eventually it takes its course, comes out of the minima and finally reaches the, uh, sometimes it may not come out. If it does not come out, then it is a misfolded state. The misfolded protein will produce you all kinds of abnormalities. New chapter, you want to go to larger systems, larger systems. Okay, there is a, here is an example of a larger system. Uh, you have a process called as endocytosis and you are trying to understand this process. The process is the following, any molecule which has to be internalized, it comes here, then it is wrapped around by this membrane, forms a vesicle and there is a protein called dynamin which actually wraps around this neck of this vesicle with GTP hydrolysis it is removed. And now this dynamin protein forms a long rope which wraps around here. Okay, now this is a very long rope. Okay, how much, how long is that? Okay, so let us see, this is the dynamin molecule. 
molecule itself is 864 amino acid wrong and it has several domains here among these it is this particular domain called GTP effector domain which is responsible for the self association of the molecule to form a long rope of dynamine. Yeah. Can we understand this process? This is the challenge. This is the challenge. Can we understand this process? What is the way the protein is aggregating? What is the way the protein is self associating? How can we understand it? What is known about this? This structure was known. Solution and crystal structures of this were, were being determined, not completely determined and crystal structure was also being determined and then we wanted to look at this aggregate, the full structure. Now, it shows here the CD spectrum shows the helical structure, this is the TEM image which shows that okay, there is a huge aggregate here and that is also shown in this. Now, if you look at the NMR spectrum, how many peaks you see? That GD domain has 140 amino acid residues. So, you should see 136 peaks here because why 136? There are some prolines. The prolines do not produce a peak, there are no amide protons there. So, therefore, you must you expect about 132 peaks, but we only saw 26. Where are the rest? The rest have gone into the interior of the core of this aggregate okay? and they have become so broad that you cannot see them. Once it becomes very huge object, then you cannot see the signals from there and therefore, you have this problem. None of these techniques helped and what is the strategy? Here you see I am showing you, I call it as when <laughs> I use this when I talk to the physicists, call it as a dark matter. You know what is dark matter? So, in the universe, what you see, what you see from various astronomical observations and things like that, various theories, it is only 5 percent of the matter which is present. It is only 5 percent. Remaining 95 percent is not visible to you. Okay. Some of that is people call this a dark energy, some of it is dark matter. We still do not know what that dark matter is. So, physicists always call this as dark matter. So, now I call it dark matter because we cannot see the signals from this. When there is kind of a of, uh, aggregate formation like this, these lines are so broad, this is indicated here because of the tumbling rate is so sluggish, the whole thing is so sluggishly tumbling, therefore, you do not see the signals coming from there. So, what do you do? You do this strategy. You dissociate this hole into the monomers by using these tricks of various kinds of uh, denaturants and things like that. Now, these ones are observable, these ones are now unfolded as well, but use the methods what we had discussed earlier to assign these individual ones and start to reassociate it here. And when you start reassociating, you know which ones are going into the interior first, which ones are going later. Step wise you can follow the association process okay? and see this is what happens. You start with a dissociated state and then you go slowly change the conditions it goes into the associated state step wise. So, you monitor the changes in the intensities of these peaks systematically and you can follow the pathway of the association of this. Now, what is the size of this protein? Several megadaltons. You can see image in the TEM image, right? The TEM image goes from nanometers. The size of this is in several nanometers, 10 nanometers, 20 nanometers. 10 to 20 nanometers means it is about megadaltons in size. Okay? Now, you are trying to est uh, to address such a large system. Okay? So, you can actually approach that and we did that okay? without going into this full details. This all shows the whole process of progressing from 6 molar guanidine to 0 molar guanidine, how the peaks disappear here systematically, how these relaxation rates go up and then they disappear here. Okay? By doing this, this is the structure formation monitored by the circular dichroism along with this and that will tell you what sort of a structure is getting formed systematically 4 molar structure is getting formed here initially and then this further spreads in this area and then aggregation happens. These ones all go into the interior systematically and these ones remain at the end and these are those 26 peaks which you are seeing. Okay, this is the process. more structure formed, stable structure formed. Okay, now, you see the interaction between these and they are getting formed, this is the electrostatic interactions here which brings them together in this manner and you have a rope 
formed. The rope is formed, it's growing, right? It's growing like this. So you have two ends here which have charges, and therefore these are positively charged and they wrap around the membrane vesicle. The membrane is membrane is negatively charged. There are phosphates on the surface. Therefore, these positive charges wrap around this and hold it tightly together on the surface of the membrane. So, therefore, okay. Now, that is the so-called the protein data, protein world, how to analyze the protein world. And now, I just, this is only one slide I have to show you that another innovation, development, again, once again, to, I showed you the first picture once that how you can see the inside of your body without cutting the body. And that was done by these two gentlemen here. This is Peter Mansfield and Paul Lauterbur. And now look at this machine. You go inside here. This only shows the picture of the head, but you can get the whole body imaging. Entire body can be imaged and you can figure out where the any abnormalities exist, cancer growths and things like that. You can figure out that. And that is the contribution of these people. And incidentally, I must also tell you, Paul Lauterbur, what is his background? Anybody knows? Paul Lauterbur was an electrical engineer. Electrical engineer learnt biology and developed this machine to image. Initially, he showed the image of two test tubes. He probably himself also did not imagine that it will reach this stage. But it has taken this Peter Mansfield also, he is also a physicist, called ecoplanar imaging, he developed. And as a consequence of that, now you can record the image in few minutes because of these two developments and they shared the Nobel Prize in, in 2003 and now this prize is in the area of physiology and medicine. And what do they measure here? They just measure water. They just measure the water distribution in the body. The protons in the water give you the signal. Wherever there is a bone, it does not give you the signal. So, therefore, the tissues will give you the signal. So, wherever there is water, you give this, get the signal. Therefore, you get the image of this body, all these bones and things like that. Wherever there is a change in the water density, you will see a change in the intensity of the peak and therefore, it will tell you whether there is a cancer present or not. So, that was the contribution. Of course, there are other contributions like functional MRI. Functional MRI which actually can tell you what is the activity going on inside your brain. Are you telling a lie or truth? If you are challenged with something, are you telling a lie? If you are telling a lie, your activity is different. Therefore, by functional MRI, you can actually use it in, in forensic sciences. Okay? So, you can therefore look at, look at the applications. Look at the applications. Where all it has gone? Psychology. This is area of forensic sciences leads with psychology and development in, at, in, in, your, uh, in your brain. Okay? I think I will stop here. I have covered a lot of ground and a lot of our students have worked on some of these and in fact, I listed here all of those students who have worked various places and your Krishna, Krishna Mohan is also here. Of course, I did not talk about his protein and there are, <laughs> he did a lot of work on a particular protein DLCN, but uh, I picked up a few of those things which are illustrative from the point of view of applications to different, different kinds of challenging projects, challenging models. So, with that, I think I will stop. Thank you very much. And, uh, these are the facilities, we use the facilities, these are our NMR facility at TIFR, and we use the NMR facilities at IIT Bombay, IIT Bombay and TEM facility at IIT Bombay and so on. Okay, thank you.